football is the most popular sport on the planet. This shouldn't come as a surprise to anyone who's experienced the excitement of match day. It's hard to remain indifferent when thousands of tightly packed fans, each patriotically sporting the colours of their team, sing, cheer and heckle in unison. The thrill of a crunching challenge, a derby victory or a last minute winner will undoubtedly elicit excitement. For the sceptic, there is nothing beyond this superficial appeal. Full ball is simply a game of chance, in which the sport's novelty appeal is only sustained through blind patriotism. Football is pushpin and is not to be confused with poetry. Durham University's Stephen Mumford defends football in the face of this attack. For Mumford, football has an intellectual depth that rewards more detailed consideration. When we watch football through a philosophical lens, we are called to deliberate a great wealth of ideas from categories of aesthetic virtue and the role of chance, control and victory, to the nature of a team and the persistence of a club throughout time. As always, thank you to the podcast chairs, Cullum St. Gabriel's and the West Hill Endowment, as well as the loyal supporters for cheering on the show. In particular, thank you to Dylan Kirby, Lily Hooper, David Legeness, Mr. T, Jimmy Casperson and Jim Clare. If you're enjoying our aesthetic display and you're committed to supporting the show as Dylan, Lily, David, Mr. T, Jimmy and Jim, head over to the Patreon forward slash Pantycast to show your support. A link is also available in the iTunes description. Like a game of football, the podcast comes in two halves. In part one, we're going to be looking at the philosophy behind the game. And in part two, we're going to engage in some further analysis and discussion. And welcome to episode 74 of the Pan Psycast. I'm the single organic hole that is Jack Symes. I'm joined once again by the man doing kickups to the detriment of our listeners' enjoyment, Dr. Gregory Miller. Hello. And the man creating art and getting results, Professor Stephen Munford. Hello. Thank you for joining us on the show, Stephen. Um, we should say right from the off that uh, we're talking about football as in soccer for our American listeners. And we encourage you not to be dissuaded, as you'll find out there's lots of a philosophy that goes above and beyond just the sport itself that we're going to be uh, talking about today. So if you're not a fan of football, maybe you will be for starters at the end of this episode. And um, and if you are, then you've, you've certainly, and you like philosophy as well, hence you're listening to the show, then you're in for a real treat. The microphone's around, the recording will last 90 minutes, everything else is pure theory. So the first question we ask all our guests, Stephen, is what is philosophy? Nice and easy one to start off with. No, that's a really, really difficult question <laughs> because, um, I mean, what is philosophy? Is itself a philosophical question? Um, different philosophers are going to have views about what, what philosophy is, how you should do philosophy. I think it's, uh, you know, there's some standard accounts that everybody will know of, love of wisdom, but that doesn't tell you very much. Uh, it's very abstract. Uh, it, in, it involves uh, looking at questions that many people find childish. And I, and I sometimes think that um, it's almost like an attitude because I, I, I know many people, they'll hear a philosophical question and they'll just think, well, that's stupid. What, you know, why ask that? Philosophers don't help themselves because they, they often come up with the most ridiculous and extreme examples like... You know, if, if I walk in a hospital ward and there's a there's a room full of patients each waiting for organ transplants and they need different organs, is it right that they kill me and harvest all my organs and six of them live and I die? Well, so it's not going to happen. <laughs> yeah, they might say, well, that's not going to happen. Yeah, but that's not the point. It's it's a, an interesting question. It's very abstract. It's very general. That's what philosophy does, and it's kind of testing a theory. Hmm. So it's it, it's not testing it because it it is the sort of thing that ever is likely to happen. Hmm. But what a question like that does is if if you have a general theory like the good is that which procures the greatest happiness of the greatest number. Right then that's an example that tests the theory and whether that's the theory that you want. So would you say then philosophy is about coming up with these theories and then putting them to the test with these 
Uh, like you have a nice thought yeah, experiment. Yeah, be- because uh, I mean, what what distinguishes philosophy from many other disciplines is that it's non-empirical. So we we can't settle philosophical questions just using the evidence of our senses, as you would in uh, many sciences. They're entirely empirical. So how we test a theory in philosophy can't be through data or evidence or or. You could say, well, the, the 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 only data there is is things like thought experiments, using uh, reason, using pure reason, and so on. So I think that's that's the way I see philosophy. I also think it's the most important thing, but maybe that's just because I'm a philosopher. Even more important than football. Well, yes, because if you want to understand football, then. It helps to get a philosophical understanding of it. You can have a philosophy of, of anything. In fact, it, it really pleases me um, how much people generally have, have a sense of philosophy, a sort of having a philosophy of something, often with a small p. Mm. But as, as a point I, I think I make in the book, now at just about every interview I see with a philosophy, uh, sorry, with a football coach, mm. They, they talk about their philosophy. You know, you, they want to know what's your philosophy. So I think there is a sense that philosophy is a kind of bedrock uh, that you build everything else on. So so if you're going to go into football coaching, you have to think, well, well what, uh, you know, what do I want to do? Do I want to be attacking? Do I want to... Do I want to exhibit the higher values of the game or do I just want to win at all costs? Would I rather win 4-3 or 1-0? Mm-hmm. And, and the, these are not themselves empirical questions. So the coach has to have these sort of broader thoughts about how they want to play the game. So the coach has to come up with like their own first principles, as it were, something yeah, like that. Yeah, because uh, there's no kind of science that tells you whether it's better to win 4-3 mm-hmm. or 1-0. Uh, but you know, some some coaches might think that defence is is the key thing. That's what they want to build from. Others might think, well, they don't, they don't want to be in the business of football unless they can entertain. So they want to go out and try and score four goals. Football to one side for a moment. How is it then that you uh, first got into got into philosophy? Ah, uh, well, I think that relates to to what I was saying earlier about that some people find philosophical questions pointless and stupid, and some mm-hmm. people find them really interesting. and And I think it's often it's it's about your character. So, I I remember when I think I was nine years old having a philosophical thought. I didn't know it was a philosophical yeah. thought at the time, but it, I was. I remember lying in bed just thinking, I know that I can have thoughts and feel sensations that no one else knows I'm having. So I I can have private thoughts. I can think in my head, you're stupid, and the other person doesn't know I'm thinking that. And then I thought, well, how do I know that other people have private thoughts in their head that, that I can't hear? And I thought, well, there's clearly no way I can know that for sure. So that's the problem of other minds, yeah. you know. And and that's what I mean about that philosophical questions can be so simple and almost childish, because me as a nine-year-old child, I can I can think that, and it's a really simple question. I think for many people, you're kind of told not to answer, not not to ask stupid questions like that. But some of us think, oh, no, that's really interesting. It's a great example of how a nine-year-old can have this thought and, like, professors at universities are working on these problems, <laughs> uh, like, full-time as their careers. You mentioned, though, that a lot of people think that there are some silly, childish questions in philosophy. Do you have that view towards any strands of philosophy yourself? Are there any parts of philosophy you're just not interested in or you do think they're uh, a bit of a waste of time, maybe? Well, there there are some areas of philosophy that I'm not interested personally, but I definitely wouldn't say that they're a a waste of time. Mm -hmm. They're just uh, certain things interest me more than others, but I've got complete respect for for those other areas. I mean, I'm not an expert epistemologist for instance mm-hmm. theory of knowledge but I absolutely admire people who do have expertise in that and and I think whatever area of philosophy you're in uh, there's always childish questions to be asked anyway so I work in metaphysics and and I can give you really simple metaphysical questions like what is a circle what is a table 
Mm -hmm. uh, how do you know objects exist when nobody's looking at them? So e even an area like metaphysics, which can get very technical, uh, it, it, it can be very simple. So uh, some, somebody said to me, it was uh, Bill Brewer, who was a London philosopher, I heard him say that philosophy has a very low floor, right. but a really high ceiling. So what he means is the low floor, you, you can start a philosophical conversation with the most simple question like, what is a circle? Mm -hmm. But there's no limit to how far you could go with that, how, how high that debate could end up going, because you can get into Plato's forms and uh, imminent versus transcendent realism about universals and so on. So from the most simple question, you can go as far as you want. In, in another life, say you you know, weren't a nine year old and didn't think that philosophical thought and it took and it didn't take you into doing philosophy, what would you think you would be doing, you know, in some other possible world where you weren't a philosopher? Definitely a plumber. Definitely a plumber. I've had time to think about this. I once had to change the flush valve on my toilet system and it was fascinating. I liked how it worked with just uh, gravity and vacuums. Oh well <laughs> <laughs> when, when was this? When did you have this thought? Oh, a couple of years ago, but I've always liked a bit of DIY plumbing. You're still at home. trying to change the career. <laughs> I'm not Corgi registered though, so I don't want any listeners <laughs> uh, contacting you saying they, they've got a job doing on the to do on their boiler. <laughs> um, staying true to like uh, I guess your philosophical upbringing, uh, we spoke to Rutger Bregman last year, the Dutch uh, historian. And he told us at 19 years old, he had a professor who said that everyone should have an intellectual hero. So the next day, he finds himself on his computer looking at Googling lots of influential thinkers from the 20th century, coming across um, Bertrand Russell, um, who, who he says now is, is his intellectual hero. He converted him from theism to atheism through his book, Why I'm Not a Christian. Do you have like a, a, a significant uh, philosophical or just generally intellectual uh, figure from history or today, which um, stand out from the crowd, I do, uh, and I and I'm I am also quite a big fan of Bertrand Russell, and I've I've read most of his books and enjoyed it. But my actual philosophical hero is Socrates. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. uh, and I don't know whether this is the historically accurate Socrates mm. because because we don't know. But but what I love about Socrates is his humility. Mm. So he accepts that the philosophical problems are bigger than all of us. He teaches us not to get big headed. He teaches us that our natural instinct should be skepticism. You know, that if, if you hear a theory, then the philosophical attitude you should have is to doubt it and to mm -hmm. question it. And also he, he, he applies those standards to his own thinking as well. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, may, maybe I'm reading this just through Plato's representation and we, we're not going to know for sure, but that that kind of... Uh, what we understand of Socrates, I think, embodies the, the correct attitude that we should have in doing philosophy. I, I sometimes worry when I see philosophers who get a bit too confident mm -hmm. in their own abilities or in their own theories, um, because I think we, we should approach philosophy in a humble way. It's a brilliant answer. We've just finished. Uh, you're coming off the back of our eight part, well, eight part series on Socrates where we've went a Euthyphro, oh. um, Apology, Crito, Fido. Is there a particular Platonic dialogue that sticks out for you as a, as a favourite? Well, I mean, it used to be the Republic because I studied that as a student. But as I've gone through my career, um, different dialogues have become more important. So I've been doing a lot of work on the metaphysics of absence and uh, negation and nothingness. So I've been studying the sophists, oh, uh, which you know many people think is one of the more difficult ones, mm -hmm. along with the Theotetus. But when you read Plato, you see, I mean, I, I, I always found it amazing how these ancient philosophers made such progress and, mm -hmm. and had such fine achievements. And, you know, the, the philosophy in the Theotetus and the Sophist is, is as good as anything and well worth studying. You mentioned there, Stephen, that you reading those because you going on, you're working on the absence or the metaphysics yes. of absence. Could you tell us about that a little more? Oh, Are you yes. writing a book on this at the moment? Yeah, that's right. I'd be delighted to tell you. Yeah. So as I'm getting on a bit, you mm -hmm. know, I've got quite a few decades to look back on and in the uh, in the early 90s I think it would have been around 91 when I was just mm. starting my PhD mm. I read David Armstrong's The Theory of Universals and uh, there's a, a short chapter in there on whether there are negative properties mm -hmm. 
So given that I'm five feet, 10 inches tall, do I also have the negative property of being not five feet, 11 inches mm. tall? So Armstrong had some arguments for, for why there were no negative mm -hmm. properties. But when I read this, uh, I thought that the arguments were all question begging. So I, uh, I actually wrote to David Armstrong in Australia. This is in the days before email. And I was a this impetuous early, early stage PhD student. And he sent me back this really detailed handwritten reply. Yeah, uh, yeah and he was explaining. He, he conceded, yes, the arguments are a bit question begging, but he still didn't think that there were negative properties. So I just put that on the back burner for a while. And then as, as I went through over the, the, the following decades, a, a few other problems came up that were related to absence. Mm. So, for instance, causation by absence. You can go away on holiday, you come back and your plants are all dead. What killed them? Absence of water. But how can the absence of something have causal powers? Mm. Um, then perception of absence. Mm. Uh, you know, I, I can go into a room and see that Pierre is not there. Well, how do I see that something's not there? So I, after a while, I started to put together a host of different problems that all seem to be about absence and nothingness. And I thought, wouldn't it be great if um, we could have a common solution to all these different problems? But I wanted one that n didn't treat non-being or nothingness as if it were something. Mm -hmm. And that, that's very hard to do. But, but what I basically realized towards the end of the project, so I've just finished that book, mm -hmm. is that it's basically a project entirely in the spirit of Parmenides, mm -hmm. another ancient philosopher, because Parmenides is the philosopher who said nothing comes from nothing. Mm -hmm. uh, there are no degrees of being. There's, there's just being what is, is, and what is not, is not. Uh, so all those themes about the, the metaphysics of absence and nothingness are there to be found in Parmenides, which you could argue is the very first philosophical problem, because Parmenides is, is the f earliest philosopher whose, whose work survives, and it is recognisably uh, what philosophy that, of the kind that we do today. I, I wonder, earlier on you said uh, the, you know, the floor is deep in philosophy, the ceiling's high. Mm. Now you can ask a question like, uh, what is a circle? Uh, and it is no end to that discussion. Yeah. But the listener might be thinking that we, we're just going round in circles, perhaps, that <laughs> we're still talking about Plato and Parmenides. You're picking out philosophers from 2,000 years yes. ago and talking about their same ideas now. So do, is philosophy making progress? Or are we just going over the same stuff over and over again? Yeah, well, that's a good question. I, I've got a dear friend in St. Louis called Ruth Groff, a philosopher, and, and she's got this view that she thinks there's only something like 10 philosophical <laughs> ideas. and we've just, we've just been recycling them for thousands of years. I, I'm not so sure about that. I, I think there is some progress, but I think it's it's really steady. You know, sometimes we, we discover a, a new technical apparatus or there's a there is a sort of conceptual innovation where progress occurs. But I, I, I do think I mean, I've, I've said this in print in the past and uh, I don't want this to, to sort of be insulting to my contemporaries, but I think philosophers can sometimes be a bit too self-congratulatory mm. and think that what they're doing is absolutely fantastic and so much better than what's occurred in the past. I'm not sure. I mean, I, I, I suspect that the greatest leap forward ever made in philosophy was, was it with Aristotle. I mean, I think it's amazing how much Aristotle got right. Uh, since which time, I think there's just been sort of gradual incremental progress, sometimes a bit, a bit of uh, backward progress, I don't want to offend people, but I actually think Descartes took a step backwards in philosophy. Okay. I, I enjoy mentioning these old philosophers because I'm actually not a historian of philosophy. I'm, I'm, I would be known for some, somebody who is very contemporary, does yeah. contemporary stuff. But I, I also um, definitely appreciate the, the wisdom of our predecessors. A last question on this section. We are speaking about your like your upbringing in philosophy and so on. Um, Plato, uh, Parmenides, looking at a philosophy of football, and Bertrand Russell being an impact as well as Socrates. Before getting into philosophy and now, has there been any major changes in your in your thinking? Have you 
went on to abandon, like we gave the example of Rutger Bregman early who abandoned his theism after reading Why I'm Not a Christian. Have you had any big significant changes in your thinking? Yeah, I think so. I, I think philosophers should always be open to changing their mind. I mean, we, we've got to be open to rational persuasion. I, I, in my career, I've, I've had a, a fairly consistent philosophy that I've been developing and it's been about around causal powers that's mainly what I'm known for but I've had some very big changes of mind so initially I wanted to work on free will Mm. and I wanted to develop a determinist view basically saying that we had no free will but then uh, when I started reading the literature so this was in the first six months of my PhD, which was going to be on free will. Started reading the literature and uh, I saw it was full of all this, these metaphysical terms like causation, law of nature, property. And I thought, well, I've, to work on free will, I need to do a bit of metaphysics. I need to learn what these things are. But once I start doing metaphysics, I realized this is where all the action is. Oh, okay. And and then after a while, I just sort of contented myself with compatibilism in, in the free will debate, which is that, you know, free will is compatible with determinism. But then about four or five years ago, um, I was persuaded that libertarianism is a oh, tenable well, position. You might be our first libertarian on the show. <laughs> it means I've held, during the last 30 years, I've held all three of the main <laughs> positions on free will. But it was... It, I need to see an argument that persuades me. And another even more recent conversion is that I've become an emergentist, mm. uh, which mm-hmm. you know I wouldn't have been five years ago. So not, not just about mental phenomena. It's not just the mind emerges from mindless mm-hmm. parts. I'd also, I can see how emergence applies to other things such as life emerging from lifeless parts. Mm. You know, so I'm a living creature, but I know that my parts are not living. Mm. You know, ultimately, I'm just made up of some fairly mundane chemicals that you could find in the street. But if you put those together in a particular combination, it can make a living organism. So emergence is a topic that's really started to interest me. Half one. These people that say that's half fine, that's one. Good. First half. <laughs> yeah, first start. half one. First half. The philosophy behind the game. Okay, so let's kick off with um, what people you might call the superficial appeal of football, right? In essence, what drew you into football in the first place? And how did this, how did it become a thing in your life? Well, I, I grew up in this small city called Wakefield, which I think was one of the biggest places in Britain that didn't have a football team of, okay. of any note whatsoever. It was a rugby town. So I, there was no football I could go to, but where, when I was young, we got our first colour television. And it was just about the time of the 1974 World Cup. Mm. I heard this, this was not episode number 74 for you, and 74 is a special number because... The 74 World Cup was the, the World Cup of Johan Cruyff and mm. Beckenbauer. And uh, as a little kid, so I would have been nine years old, seeing that on a colour TV, yeah. you know, the, the orange shirts, Johan Cruyff, he was like a, a superhero. So I think football has that immediate kind of aesthetic appeal, you know, and I, and I think it's no coincidence that it has that aesthetic appeal because... Mm. All spectator sports are sort of competing for your attention. Mm. And the way to get your attention, which, you know, there are commercial reasons why they want to get your attention, but the way to do it is to to have that immediate appeal. So when you see the green pitch with those different coloured shirts Mm. and how all the different teams have different kits, you know, as a little kid you get to recognise, you know, Sweden have got that yellow shirts with blue shorts and so on. So, yeah, there, there is a very superficial but immediate appeal that... You know, even a, a four-year-old can see that. And I do think this is part of the, the the success of football is that it appeals on many levels from that very superficial level to to the level where 
you know, people can have a really in-depth tactical understanding of mm. the game. And do you think it was a coincidence then that both at nine years old, that was when you had, you know, these oh, solipsistic yes. kind of, <laughs> am I the only mind? Are there other minds? How can, and at the same time, that was when you went, ah, this is the thing I, this, here's this other thing that I love and it's football. Wow. Maybe I was having the philosophical thoughts during the 1974 <laughs> World Cup. Maybe <laughs> Johan Cruyff had started something off in me. Outside of uh, watching the, the 74 World Cup, is it soon after that you went to your first game as well? And what was the difference between like watching on television and, and going to, going yeah, to the stadium so itself? Yeah, I, um, I had a good school friend called Richard Clark, who I'm still friends with, so maybe he'll listen to this. My own dad had no interest in football whatsoever, so he couldn't take me to any football. And we're in Wakefield, so there's no local team. But uh, my friend Richard Clark, his dad was um, a supporter of the mighty Halifax Town. Right. <laughs> and, and, what uh, league of Halifax Town in these ooh, days? Now the, the sort of, um, what's it called? The top top level used to be called the Conference. It's now called the Vanarama League. Oh, okay. So it's fifth level. They're doing well, I'm told. Um, Halifax Town in 75, September 75, they mm. drew Sheffield United in the League Cup. Oh, okay. Now, when growing up in Wakefield, we used to get this Sunday afternoon football show that was all about the local teams. Mm. And so one week you'd get Leeds United, another week, well, at the time, in the early 70s, Sheffield United were a real gr glamour team because mm. they had Tony Curry and Alan Woodward. You're too young to know any of these names. Uh, so the idea of seeing Sheffield United, uh, we still had Tony Curry and Alan Woodward and all those names. That was fantastic. So that was my first game. So that was at the Shea Halifax. And when I went in, so now I'd, I would have been 10 years old, it seemed to me like Wembley Stadium. It was huge. Mm. I'd never seen so many people. I now actually know that the Shea in 1975 was nothing like Wembley Stadium. <laughs> but w what a wonderful experience. Uh, but then it, it wasn't until um, a few years later, my my sister got this uh, boyfriend who liked football. And uh, turned out he was a Sheffield United supporter. Did I want to go to the game with him? Yes, absolutely. So I've been going ever since going to the stadium there's uh, anyone who's been lucky enough to go along you, the, the chanting from the crowd like the kind of rituals about what you do when certain things happen on the pitch like you explained the the big green grass in front of you and the way the ball's bouncing around the pitch and um, there's so much going on you get you really get caught up in the moment why is it you think that so there's twice as many uh, like male fans and female fans and in the usa it's the fourth most popular sport why don't we see this being uh, universal across it's the most popular but why isn't it everyone's favorite yeah well i think that that's good. there's going to be different reasons there uh, largely historical yes i think you're right probably is in in uk it's it's mainly men who are going to go watch it and i think we have to think about whether they're with the stadiums are understood as welcoming spaces for women mm. and people of, of any background of course women's football now is starting to get some of the attention that the, the man's sport has had so i mean i think we have to think about issues of, of inclusion and reasons why the men's game isn't as popular as the as the women's game and so on i don't think it's anything to do with uh, i don't know men being naturally better at playing football than women i don't think it's anything to do with that i think it's it's um, you know there's going to be historical reasons about the place of women in society right okay just to push you on just interesting your view really on on something you mentioned there uh, football sayings being welcoming to women if you in, now and in in the past do you do you see them yourself as welcoming places yeah well so the, the, this is one thing i was going to go on to so yeah, so i started going to football to the stadiums regularly in 1980 right and no, the stadiums were not welcoming spaces. Mm. I mean, I, I start the book by uh, talking about how shabby the stadium mm. was. You know, you used to have to stand up. Uh, sometimes there wasn't even any roof where you, on the terraces. Mm. And of course, all through the 80s was, was possibly the peak of football hooliganism as yeah. well. So it didn't feel safe at all. There's been enormous improvements over time now. And, you know, it's, it does feel safe for, for children and, and uh, pe people of any background. But, uh, but I can still see how there's still 
a, a distance to go. I don't think uh, we're entirely there. Mm. One thing I was going to say about that, so yeah, I started going in 1980, so I'd have been about, what, 15 by then. And I was also sort of doing A-levels, thinking of going to university, right. wanting to study philosophy. And straight away, I saw a bit of a tension between those two parts of my life okay. you, you know there was the hmm. thinking about stuff and then you then going to going to the match in the mid 80s and it was you know a very kind of visceral experience it seemed all animalistic at times hmm. you know and and you'd you'd get some anthropologists like Desmond Morris suggesting that you know we, it was very tribal yeah. and we, we were just getting out our aggression and, mm -hmm. and everything and so I started to see a, a kind of struggle, a tension, a tension between the kind of intellectual development I was yeah. going through and and the fun that I was having at the, at the football. Mm -hmm. And then when I became a professional philosopher eventually and found out there was this thing called philosophy of sport, mm. I thought, well, that, that's um, you know a possible opportunity to try and bring these two worlds together. Mm. Before that in my life, they were completely separate. I was a a philosopher in the week and then at the weekend I was a football fan and it was amazing to think that you could actually do philosophy of sport and philosophy of football. Well that's some, something I took from the book and being a huge fan of football myself but not going to as many games but always watching it on television it's a, it ended up being a big part of my life but I've always kept philosophy and football separate as well mm. and one thing I did love about the book was it actually tapped into some of the depth that I kind of I imagined a new was there, but never knew where to start about thinking, thinking about those things. So mm. I'm grateful you're writing it and presenting it in such an engaging way. So you can get your teeth into some of these ideas. And interesting. I think I've heard you elsewhere speaking about in the, in the 80s as well, not or even in the early 90s. Um, you wouldn't tell people, people wouldn't more generally wouldn't tell people you're a football fan because <laughs> there's, there's a bit of a shame to, to going along with the hooliganism at the time. There was definitely. Uh, so before I went to university, I, uh, I applied for a job in the civil service. OK. And at the end of the interview, there, there's, there's sort of one of the last questions I said, what, what are you interested in? <laughs> and I thought, should I tell them? And I, I did. I said, oh, I, I like football. And I immediately got a follow-up question about violence. Okay. What's, what is it with all this violence, you know? And I thought, have I blown it? Am I not going to get the job now because I've admitted I'm a football fan? Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, to be honest, there were times I went to football in the 80s. And people wouldn't recognize it now. Mm -hmm. You know, you could go. Uh, so a couple of times I went to Old Trafford and paid £1.50 on the gate mm -hmm. to go in. You didn't have to buy tickets in advance. And, um, you know, you just go on and stand in the terrace on the terraces and it was a completely different kind of person who went to football. You know, I've, I've been to some games where so many of the people there were looking for trouble, for yeah. instance, in the 80s. And now you go and there's families and, and it's it's a lot. totally different experience. Did you get the job in the civil service or was that I the, did, that was the I did. I, I worked in the Not DHSS for three years. <laughs> Through the miners' strike, for instance, they they were very interesting times. Yeah, um, let's tap into some of, in some of the depth of of, of the game. Then we, talk, we mentioned earlier what uh, philosophy is more generally, and you mentioned that earlier on that all managers will kind of have a philosophy. And one of my favourite quotes from the book, um, you're talking about Jose Mourinho, and you say being grumpy is not the same as being profound, <laughs> which I thought was excellent. Um, <laughs> So what is this uh, philosophy of the game? And you, you speak about aesthetics. You mentioned that a moment ago. Could you just, for listeners unfamiliar, could you tell us what aesthetics is and an example perhaps of football's aesthetic value? I think some coaches, and, and some of them have said this, they, they want to play the game, what, what they would say, the, the right way. Hmm. Want to play it the right way, which often means playing beautiful football. You can get some players who, who see the game this way. I mean, take a slightly o older example, Eric Cantona. Some listeners might have heard of Eric Cantona. You know, he, he was someone else who liked to come across as quite profound. But I think he, he had a bit more basis to it than Mourinho. Uh, yeah, so he, he had a view about how the game should be played and what, what he was in it for. And so what's this beauty part? They want a beautiful game. What do they mean when they say, I want a beautiful game? Well, it's often very hard to pin down. So, I mean, that, that's one of the things I wanted to do in the book. So when football managers talk about, you know, having a philosophy, 
you know, I, of course, I don't think that they actually are, they are philosophers, but, but I think they've got some vague idea that they want to do things a certain way and, and those ways are not determined by, you know, what I was saying at the start about empirical evidence. So it's not as if there's any fact of the matter whether you should try to play beautifully. Uh, that's that's a matter of choice and it's it's a matter of any principles you might have. You know, so the, there's an example I give in the book of a South American team called Estudiantes who had a lot of success in the late 1960s, but they played the game in a very brutal way. So if you go on YouTube, there's some footage of them playing Celtic for the World Club Cup in something like 68. And and they really just went there to, to kick lumps off the Celtic <laughs> players. Uh, but they won, you know, so they're yeah. the world champions. But that was a club where, uh, I mean, may, maybe the story gets twisted over time, but it, it sounded like somebody in the club at some point said, no, I'm not prepared for us to win ugly. Ah. So, yeah, so even if it means we're going to be less successful, we mm. think that there's a right way to play football and a wrong way to play football. And we're going to play it the right way. Mm -hmm. And now people would say, well, who's Estudiantes? Yes, that, that's the point. They're, they're not as big a club as they were then, but they were immensely successful. So that, that's a philosophical decision. You know, would, would you rather lose beautifully or win ugly? So I'm watching the game, uh, like a Ronaldo chip um, over the goalkeeper or, a bicycle, or Wayne Rooney's bicycle kick against Man City mm. um, to win the game in the, in the final minutes. What is it about these that make them an aesthetic experience? We're all sat around this table now with microphones. We're looking at you both. I'm not having an aesthetic experience like I, I do watching Wayne Rooney's goal. Mm. Even better if it's in slow motion, right? So what is it about this that's different from that? Does that make sense? Yeah, well, there's, there's uh, lots of different theories of aesthetics, for instance. And uh, so, I mean, one, one view is that if you have an aesthetic perception of something, then it's a kind of disin disinterested perception. And disinterested in the sense that uh, I could look at a cup on the table hmm. and I'm seeing it as something that I could go fill with water. So, so it's, it's what people would say is purposive. Right. So the cup is, I'm looking at it, I'm just thinking of what purposes I would have to use the cup. Mm -hmm. Whereas to take an aesthetic perception, I'm, I'm not thinking of its purpose at all. I'm just becoming absorbed in that perception. So it's a kind of appreciation of the experience itself. Right. And I, and I think that has some application to, to football, mm -hmm. but it's going to be highly complex because clearly there are purposes in football, mm. you know. So say the Rooney bicycle kick. Yeah, the you know, purpose for, is the goal there, The right? purpose was the goal. The and, and, I, and I think give, given that football it, it is primarily about victory, mm -hmm. you know. You know, so let let's not get carried away and think it's all just about aesthetic appreciation. Mm -hmm. It is primarily about winning, and so I think that that Rooney bicycle kick had had he done up virtually the same action, but the ball had gone six inches over the crossbar. I don't think we would be looking at that and thinking. What an amazingly beautiful bicycle kick. Yeah. Although it could have been visually indistinguishable. Mm -hmm. The difference, only difference is where the ball ends up. So I, th I think the aesthetics of football are going to be quite complicated. And, uh, you know, so um, it's going to be tied up with a lot of different things. So an, another view that I've got that uh, I talked about in a, an earlier book that I had on philosophy of sport was how... Um, partisans can see games differently from purists. Could you explain what these are? I can explain that. Yeah, so a purist is, is going to be someone who's just there for the, the pleasure of the game. They might not support either of the teams who are mm -hmm. playing. Uh, whereas the partisan is a supporter of one of the sides. Right. This is a hard distinction. So you're either a partisan or a purist. Every football fan, either a partisan, they just want their team to win and they can't see beauty in the opposition scoring. And a purist... They can appreciate all good football, but they might prefer their team to win. You're yeah. either one or the other. Yeah, that's right. Well, I think that itself is also complicated because mm. I, when I watch Sheffield United, I'm a partisan. But when I watch the World Cup, when it's, I don't know, Chile against Saudi Arabia, mm. I, I might be a purist because I don't, I don't 
care which team wins and I just want to see a good game of football. So so I, I think that's difficult. You can oscillate between partisanship and purism. So I, I think it, it's it's also very complicated. But yeah, the idea is, so I think there's a story I tell in this book. I, mm-hmm. I, I once witnessed uh, Eric Cantona score a very famous goal against Sheffield United. Mm-hmm. And to my shame, uh, I did not appreciate the beauty at all <laughs> now i've got a bit older and a, you know i'm able to have a more distanced perspective mm. with the passage of time i can appreciate a bit better what a brilliant right beautiful goal it pains me to say it but yes it was a beautiful goal but it was against my team so that that's the sort of thing that i think comes into play you partisans are going to really appreciate the beauty when it's their own side that produces it and maybe not even see it when the opponent produces it. Ah, so we both, let's say we've got Man City v United. Wayne Rooney scores the bicycle kick in the last few minutes of the game. And the Man United fans think that's the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. Like an incredible goal, an incredible game. And they're blown away by this aesthetic experience. The Man City fans have a complete opposite reaction. They're they're distraught, they're upset, they're, they're angry. Uh, maybe... They're completely passive and they're, they're, they're just not moved by it at all. Yeah. Does this mean that all aesthetic judgments are subjective and completely down to the individual watching it? Yeah, I mean, I, I think they're cognitively laden. So so what I mean by that, it's not just that, say, the, the City fans see a beautiful goal but choose not to like it. Mm. I think that because they have negative thoughts about it in the first place, that they don't even see it as beautiful. So so what I mean by cognitively laden is that your thinking gets all wrapped up in the experience Mm. and and your beliefs and desires can actually affect whether you have the aesthetic experience or not. Mm -hmm. Ben Say Nane last year or recently released a, a, a very short introduction to aesthetics. He gives this example of... Donald Trump and the villain and Goldfinger, and when you see um, the, the resemblance between the two people, you can no you can no longer enjoy the Goldfinger character because of his association. <laughs> and there's that other example in psychology of um, you may have heard this one. Participants are asked to throw or uh, watch a baseball clip and count how many times the team in white throw and catch the ball. And then they're asked at the end, "Did you see the gorilla yes. walking across?" And and they all say <laughs> no. But, but those that keep the black too. So it, are we saying that background concepts and we're just looking for something there on the basis of our pre-existing beliefs to support them aesthetically? Something uh, like this. Yeah. I mean, well, something like that. So so another example that's often discussed in in aesthetics is Lenny Riefenstahl, who was a revolutionary filmmaker in the nineteen mm. thirties, and she she innovated a a whole bunch of film techniques that right. hadn't been used before. But unfortunately, all the films she made were in glorification of her hero, Adolf Hitler. She she was a Nazi. So that's disgusting aesthetics because yeah. you think, well, is it is it beautiful, but it's just a message that we don't like? Or is the fact that it's morally abhorrent mean that you can't even have an aesthetic experience? Mm-hmm. So I, I lean towards the latter. It's not just that it was good art, but it's it was used in a bad way. I think right. the, the fact that it's used in that bad way ceases to make it an aesthetic experience for us. Yeah. So no longer enjoy reading Nietzsche or anything like that for, <laughs> a, for, a, for us uh, Nietzsche fans. Well, well no, no, I think Nietzsche Nietzsche's a different case because I... I I don't think he was a Nazi. Or well, off, but he's associated with all this back. It wasn't the spokes after to given to like soldiers in the Second World War. Well, maybe? yeah, yeah. So he, he, I think he was misused. But uh, no, I don't. Okay, I don't so think... it's people as long as if they play into the, the background concepts, then bad. But if we take them out yes, of context, yes. So then... it, certainly, if I believed Nietzsche was a Nazi, that could stop me uh, appreciating. Okay. And and I think this r- relates quite strongly to the case of f- football and mm. aesthetic appreciation in football, uh, because it relates to a, another aspect in in my account, which is that football is essentially pointless. Mm. Now now this might seem a strange thing to say by a football fan, okay, but but what I mean is, 
nothing really hinges on it in football. Mm. So, so of course, there are people who have a career in football. You know, it's, mm. it's a business. It's it's people's jobs. So, of course, things things matter there. But it's it's not like medicine where you know if if somebody gets a drug, it could determine whether they live or die. Mm. Whether the ball goes in the net, it's not going to kill somebody or, or anything. So mm. the, the goals in, in football or the goals in, of any sport are, are kind of pretty much made up. They're, they're yeah. sort of illusory. But it's important within the game context. And I think that gives us permission to take an aesthetic appreciation of what's going on because it's essentially pointless. So when I see a goalkeeper kind of flying through the air to save the ball, I have permission to enjoy that aesthetically. Mm. If that was the same person who had entirely the same kind of bodily position and jumping through the air, but they were actually leaping for their life from a volcano, a lava coming down, you see, then... I can't sit there thinking, oh, what a beautiful leap he's made to <laughs> save his life. It's a Hollywood life. film, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so I've, I'm not give, I've not got permission. And I, and I think that's important because when it comes to aesthetic experience, the perception is the reality. Mm. So, you know, if, if I don't, if I'm not feeling that I can enjoy watching this person jump, mm. then I'm not going to take any aesthetic pleasure from it. Mm -hmm. uh, but because football is essentially pointless, I think we do have that permission. You know, we're there... To enjoy ourselves, not all the enjoyment is aesthetic. You know, there's, there's many dimensions to the enjoyment of it. Some of it's just sort of pure emotion, wanting to win and so on. But, but I think that pointlessness of football o opens it up for our entertainment and pleasure. So to move on to something else pointless and, you know, what you might think is, uh, you know, morally abhorrent as well. And so in the book, you mentioned this, the paradox in football or some sort of of the aesthetics of football. And you talk about going to see PSG and Ronaldinho doing kickups in the middle of the game. Right. Yeah. And you say, well, there's something about this, right. Not trying to win, which high and trying to create what seems to be a beauty. Uh, beautiful experience or an aesthetic experience. Mm. This shows what you call the paradox of football, right? <laughs> so Ronaldinho there, he's doing something pointless or he's doing something morally abhorrent and you think, well, you can't do those, right? You have to be doing something else for football to be beautiful. Yeah, I, I found that kind of an interesting aspect of it that uh, you're not going to produce beauty if you're trying to produce beauty. It gets produced when you're trying to do something else, namely win. Because when you're trying to win, then you're going to exhibit all those kind of higher virtues of the sport. You know, you're going to be fast. You're going to be powerful. Mm -hmm. You know, you, your body's going to be extended to its full limit. These are the things that we enjoy seeing. So it's that kind of incentive a victory it kind of gives you the aesthetics as a byproduct so I think that's the idea. So, yeah, I mean, I, I was so frustrated uh, when I saw this player, supposedly a good player, not really trying to win. Mm -hmm. I remember uh, the United States team in the, the Women's World Cup that's just gone got a lot of flack for putting 10 or, or was it 14 goals past Yeah, they Thailand. did. Bad sports, uh, sports womanship. I think... They did the right thing. Yeah, I mean, I th I think it's disrespecting your opponent if you stop trying to win. If you right. if you stop stop trying to do as well as possible, you know, if if you start if they'd have just started passing it around and making no attempt to score, they would have mm. basically stopped playing football, mm. and it and it would have been a, a lousy um, spectacle to watch. So yeah, it was a, a mismatch, and and mismatches are not the best thing in football at all. But, you know, at least we got to see the U.S. team doing their best mm -hmm. and still playing some pretty decent football to score the goals. So, yeah, I find it very frustrating if, if uh, a team or a player doesn't try to win, especially if they're just trying to impress or do something fancy. It's not football and it's not pretty to see. Mm -hmm. Are there different forms of, like, victory, though, in the sense, is it just the scoring of goals? Because... I, just to play devil's advocate here, when I, well, maybe when I do see a game, 
So 10 nil up, there's no, I've got all the three points in the bag, I'm going through to the next round. Is there not a sense, I keep the ball, I show dominance, and I can see an aesthetic display in action. I've not only beat you 10 nil, but we'll keep the ball from you as well. And, uh, you know, when the crowd, way every time a pass is made, you can have that for the next 45 minutes. Well, I think you're right that there can be little victories uh, within a game. So um, if you take the Sheffield United back three at the moment, hmm. Jack O'Connell, so you have to remind us who they are. <laughs> and Chris Basham, oh, you, you're going to know who they are <laughs> in, over the next coming years. Everybody's going to be talking about them. Uh, I mean, they are a brick wall at the moment. They, they've only conceded seven goals in the Premier League, which is the joint lowest with Liverpool. Mm-hmm. Absolute brick wall. And and uh, so I went to the game last Monday night. Sheffield United beat Arsenal 1-0. And there, the victory for that back three is keeping that clean sheet. Mm. And uh, there's some footage of them in the last few minutes putting in those last few clearances. And they're so ecstatic when they clear the ball, yeah. they're doing the high fives and everything. So, yeah, it's, uh, within any sort of 90-minute game of football, there's going to be all these little individual battles going on. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, it's often it's about those players winning those individual battles. Mm. Uh, you know, clear, clearing the ball off the line it can be as important as a goal. Mm-hmm. So, yes, yeah, football is sort of multidimensional. There, there is the sort of final victory... Uh, I don't know, at the end of the season, there's the champions, mm. but within the season, there's individual games that you can win. And then within individual games, there's personal battles that you can win as well. One of our uh, listeners on Twitter to take up the topic of victory, uh, Owen Morris, mentioned this and he wanted to ask you is, well, if we have the potential for victory of every other season, do we not have this mentality of How does any given season get its meaning then, right? Because we can always defer to the next. There's always next season, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, Does that, I guess his question in short, is does that not like devalue each season or each smaller victory if there's always the potential for some uh, future victory? No, I I think that's one thing that's really nice about sport. I I mean, we we all live to fight another day, Mm. don't we? I mean, a nice thing about football is that there's always another game and, and I think when when you look back, when you, you kind of write the narrative of your life as a football fan, I, I find it interesting how it becomes quite easy to forget the defeats. Mm-hmm. You know, so if, if you're going to say to me, what what's your highlights as a Sheffield United supporter since 1980? I'm, I'm going to think of winning the fourth division championship mm-hmm. in... Uh, 81 82 season and then i'm going to think of winning the league league two title now that so there's been just like three good seasons you know sheffield united have not had a lot of glory in recent times but i I can forget some of those Mm -hmm. miserable two nil defeats you know so i can there's a kind of bias you have when you retell the story and as you get older you do start to appreciate that both victory and defeat are temporary Mm -hmm. You know, and and I think that teaches you some really useful lessons in life. You know, the victory and defeat, they're, they're not quite imposters, but they are they are temporary. And what counts, I think, is what you take away from that mm. and and uh, move on to the next game and stronger for it. So this is uh, this isn't something that I discussed in this book, but in another book on sport, I discussed whether the the ethics of sport are, are continuous with or completely separate from the ethics of everyday life. Mm-hmm. Because one, one one use you could say that sport has is that it teaches you valuable lessons for right. your life. An opposite view of that is that sport has its own very distinctive ethics that you would n- not want to apply to your mm. regular life. For instance, if, if I was sort of approaching the checkout queues at the supermarket and there was a little old lady in front of me and mm-hmm. she stumbled and fell then I wouldn't sort of push her aside and run to the front, you know. <laughs> Whereas in football, if if the defender slips and falls, you're perfectly entitled to get the ball, go through mm. and score, mm. you see. Whereas uh, just for your listeners, I'd point out that if somebody fell, I would help them up and make sure they got in front of me at the checkout and so on. So that suggests that there's... You know, given that sport is all about the victory, that, mm-hmm. you know, any, anything goes. And 
within the laws, I, I can do whatever I want to sort of exhibit my dominance over, over the opponent. But I'm actually somebody who, who thinks that there is a lot in sport that is continuous with the ethics of right. everyday life and that does teach us things how to, how to live our life. So somebody said, I don't know who's, who's used this term, the, the idea that sport is like a, a moral laboratory. Mm -hmm. So you kind of see that virtues and vices can be pitted against each uh. other. And you kind of see that the virtues, well, it's, if, if it is a moral laboratory with these experiments, you can see how the virtues and vices uh, sort of play off against each other. And, and there are lessons that you can learn from sport, I think. One of which being that defeats are only temporary and, mm. you know, you, you're going you're gonna to get another chance in life. Just the last question in this section, and being as we're on, on the theme already, and not quite uh, a laboratory, but uh, Albert Camus uh, famously said, everything I know about morality and the obligations of men, I owe it to football. <laughs> um, and writing back in The Guardian in 2010, a previous guest, Peter Singer, wrote a, a brilliant article called Why is Cheating OK in Football? And he spoke about uh, the England v Germany match in which Frank Lampard's uh, shot hits the crossbar. I think it is in the quarterfinal. It's the quarter or the semi? Yeah. I think it's quarter final, yeah. isn't it? Bounce off the crossbar, goes over the line before goal line technology, comes back out. And uh, Manuel Neuer, is it Neuer? Neuer, yeah. He just grabbed it and pretended he'd not seen that it was a goal and he carried did. on playing. And quote from him at the end of the game, I tried not to react to the referee and just concentrated on what was happening. I realised it was over the line. And I think the way I carried on um, so quickly fooled the referee into thinking it was not over. And Peter Singer says, to put it bluntly, Neuer cheated. And then he boasted about it. And he says he's missed the rare opportunity to do something noble in front of millions of people. Mm -hmm. And he condemns him for not doing what the morally right thing, setting a great moral example in front of the world of how one should act. Do you think Neuer is right here to, to he he's cheated, hasn't he? Or is he within the rules of the game? What no, should I'm, not gonna, I'm not going to defend Neuer. No, I'm not going to defend him. He, he couldn't get away with it now, could he? Yeah, he, he has cheated. And, and I think the key thing is whether you're sort of playing within the rules of the, the game. So I think you are permitted to do anything you can within the rules. So the, there's some debates in philosophy of sport about um, constitutive rules mm. and the idea there is if if you stop following the rules then you're not even playing the sport anymore right so okay. if if say take a, a different sport high jump you know and if, and if you think the point of high jump is to get to the other side you could say well the easiest way to get to the other side is to walk under the bar rather than jump <laughs> over it. But the point there is you're not playing the sport yeah. anymore. So, so you always broken the sport by not yeah, playing by the rules. So, so Bernard Suits, who, who wrote the best book ever in philosophy of sport called The Grasshopper, okay. he defines a, a game as a, a voluntary attempt to overcome unnecessary obstacles. So if you stop trying to overcome that unnecessary obstacle, then you're no longer playing the sport. But I think football is a little bit more complicated than that yeah. because obviously it's it's a lot of sort of borderline stuff because mm -hmm. it's, it's a contact sport. So you could have two players pushing against each other and it's a matter of judgment whether one's fouling the other or they're fouling the, the first. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I think there's... It's, it's also a sport that allows various transgressions and you're still playing the sport, but if you transgress in that way, then you may face a penalty. So, you know, so you shouldn't foul someone, but fouls occur. And if you foul a player, then the opponents get a free kick They're or a penalty for. kick. So it's, I think, in the case of football, it, mm. it is quite complicated. And the rules say that I, I did once qualify as a referee, by the way. Oh. I took the referee training course and... The law of the game states that a goal is scored only when the ball crosses the line between the post and under the crossbar mm. and the referee blows the whistle and signals a goal. Right, okay. okay, so Neuer's obviously thinking, well, if the referee hasn't awarded it, it's not a goal. So he's carrying on playing. Yeah, does that mean that, that means then that Peter Singer is wrong, right? He hasn't, he, although we might think... Um, what he's done is unsportsmanly or it's not right. cricket, as you say, he's still 
abiding by the rules of the sport, right? He hasn't broken a constitutive rule. But this, yes. Does that make but, sense? But it does make sense. But I think this is where the idea of a footballing philosophy comes mm -hmm. into it. Of course, within the rules, he can get away with it, given that the rule is, you know, the referee hasn't signalled a goal, so it's not a goal until the referee does. So he, he can get away with it. The question is whether he should, whether, mm. you know, just because you can get away with something doesn't mean he should. But that 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 is a philosophical choice yeah. to be made. And, I mean, I would forgive Neuer in the heat of the moment. He's, he's facing a completely yeah, yeah. unique situation and he's making a split-second decision. Mm. So I think sort of philosophically and ethically, he's got it wrong. Yeah. But I'm going to forgive him. I mean, footballers are under such pressure and mm. so much going on. They're, you know, they're physically exhausted. They're under stress. Mm. So I'd, um, I'd, I did another piece of work some time ago about um, whether athletes should be role models. And, right, I, okay. and I think that puts them under a lot of pressure. So, so yeah, there's ethical lessons we can take from it saying that, you know, it, it's wrong to cheat. It's it's a bit like the Guy G's ring case, isn't it? Yeah. Going going back to Plato's Republic. So you know, Neuer's got the Guy G's ring. He can get away with it. Nobody's going to know. Should he? You know, well, Plato says no. He's done wrong. But so it can give us all those kind of ethical lessons mm. in a very concrete, immediate way, without having necessarily saying Neuer is a, a villain in the piece. Yeah, good. So we might say he's, he's not, uh, we can't blame him for doing it. It raises an interesting question about ethics and fair play. Um, I took some Monopoly advice from you recently, didn't I, Greg? Can you remember what you told me to do in games of Monopoly? Because I was having a bit of a run. If of you want to win friends. in Monopoly, what you do is, obviously you buy as much property as possible. I mean, yeah, property as possible. Mm. But then all you do is you never upgrade from houses to hotels because there's a limited number of houses on the board. Yeah. So you exhaust the resources for all of the players. So say there's only 36 oh, or 24 oh, oh, oh. houses. Yeah. As, as soon as you bought them and refused to upgrade, no one can buy houses yeah. and no one can uh, basically oh. get on the property ladder. So it just becomes a slow <laughs> war of attrition. See, um, I've, I thought... With games and football, uh, if we're calling it uh, a game in a similar sense, take your advice. So I started playing with about six friends, brought all the houses, and for about an hour just had hurled abuse at me for forever. Sat there with all the... <laughs> and it's a long game to have abuse thrown at you for. So I thought it's fine just to play games within the context of the rules, and whatever you do within the rules is fine. Mm -hmm. But after being shouted down for about an hour, um, maybe I'm more encouraged that we should be... Uh, boy, more sportsmanly and the fair play. So there's a philosopher of sport in the States called Scott Kretschmar, and he would call that mm -hmm. a game flaw. A game flaw? Yeah, it, it, it seems so it's to me something wrong flaw. with the game rather than me. I'm happy yeah, it's something wrong in the structure. <laughs> I mean, if, if you had an infinite number of houses, it wouldn't be a flaw, would mm. it? But uh, I can see see the problem yeah there you go you got me off the hook there um <laughs> join us uh, next week for part two where we'll be engaging in some further analyses and discussion uh, we'll be asking some more listener questions as well and getting into some more aspects of the philosophy of sport and football uh, before we do so though before we end today uh, Stephen, you have uh, a part one installment game which is mystery philosopher the, the mystery, mystery philosopher, philosopher. So you're going to be played a quote from a philosopher. Greg, you can join in, but I think you're definitely going to know who this person is. So I'll wait for Stephen to give the answer first. And you have to guess who the philosopher is. I'll give you clues if you if you want any. So feast your ears sure on I'll need clues on this. that power of an idea. The sceptical philosopher knows that if she were to want for certainty, she would never form a meaningful relationship for fear of befriending a philosophical zombie. Any ideas who, who that is? I don't, I don't know that. I don't you don't know, know the answer? I don't think so. Ah. Do you want it a second time? A, a philosophical zombie. Yeah, so the, um, the sceptical philosopher knows that um, if they would... I can't... I'll play it once more for you. Here we go. The sceptical philosopher knows that if she were to want for certainty, she would never form a meaningful relationship for fear of befriending. A philosophical zombie. Nice. You got a eureka moment there? Beautiful. Elizabeth yeah. Anscombe? It's not Elizabeth Anscombe. It's a contemporary of yours, uh, same university. Greg, you, you want to follow it's Philip Goff. Oh. Yes. <laughs> Sorry, Philip. <laughs> <laughs>
thank you for joining us for another episode of the Pan Sai Cast. The next instalment of this episode will be available on the following Monday. Patreon subscribers already have access to the latest episode of the Pan Sai Cast. To support the show and get early access to all of the episodes, you can visit us on Patreon. That's www.patreon.com forward slash pansycast. The link is also in the iTunes description. For all the reading and to find out more about the show and get all of the old episodes completely free, you can visit www.thepansycast.com. From all of us here at the Pansycast, thank you for your support and thank you for listening. Thank you for listening. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much. It's been lots of fun. Thank you for listening. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you for listening. Thank you for listening. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for listening. Thank you all. I've enjoyed it a lot. Thanks a lot. You're very welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Goodbye. I really appreciate what you folks are trying to do. That's that was that great. Was that was really good. Great. You guys really read up on this. Yeah, that was good. Wow. <laughs> that was a lot of fun. You guys uh, managed to combine the banter and the philosophy perfectly, I think. Beautiful. Fantastic. Oh, well done, you guys. Gosh, you're doing a wonderful thing with this. <laughs>